for the invitation. Um, I was asked to talk about kind of privacy in general and why it's important and things like that. Um, to probably start out, I was studying in California for half a year and it was kind of interesting because there were a couple of people from big companies. Most of the companies said, please don't tell anybody what we're telling here. So I respect that. Only Facebook didn't really have any privacy claims of their own. So um, they were telling us about how they treat European data and um, the gist of it was not explicitly said that way. But the gist of it was, you know, the Europeans don't do anything about all their law anyway. So if you just violate these laws, nothing is going to happen. And that's more or less what we do. They didn't know that a European was in the room. So um, that kind of started my career of looking into privacy stuff. At the time, I made an access request with Facebook. So everybody has a right to get copy of their data from, from any company. And at the time, I got a PDF file on a CD of 1,200 pages. And it was kind of interesting because I only used Facebook like once a week for three years, and you still had like 1,200 pages. And I looked up, you know, how much data did, for example, the German secret services have about like really important people, and then you're around 2,000 pages, something like that. But that's about the amount of data that Facebook just collected from me in 2011 uh, within three years. So you have an idea of how much um, data there is, even though it's different quality of data probably. What's especially interesting or what was especially interesting in that data is you see it actually up there, it says deleted true. A lot of the deleted data was still there. So they just flagged it as deleted, said someone deleted it, but it's still here. So you don't see it on the screen anymore, but suddenly I got all this deleted information back. Um, I put all of that online and thought, you know, that's kind of a fun story. Let's have a little web page. And I think a couple of weeks later, we were like on the front pages of most European news, uh, news, pay, uh, news, um, news, full stop. <laughs> and, um, and our server broke down. We had more clicks than we could probably work on. And I realized it's kind of weird because you're this little student at the time. I was 32 years, uh, 23 years old. And you're suddenly the forefront of European privacy. And I think that says a lot about how we do privacy in Europe, because we do have all these laws and fundamental rights and all of that kind of stuff. But no one ever claims their rights or really goes after it much, at least at the time back then. And so I was suddenly, that's the court of justice, suddenly that one student going after the big companies, and you're suddenly a thing, not because what we did was so smart, but because no one else has done something like that. Um, and you get these weird pictures that I pull that up um, online. You're suddenly, as a student, in there, and you have the half the world media in front of you asking you about privacy just because you once said, you know, I would actually like you to comply with it. That would be cool. And um, yeah, suddenly end up being that privacy hero. It even goes so far that this was a picture that was taken from the Court of Justice itself. And actually, I was just pointing it to people like, can you guys come over? And they even tried to make it a victory then and you know, make you that hero somehow. So it's kind of weird in which situations you get into. Um, that's a bit like personal background. Um, I, I just wanted to talk more about privacy in general. And obviously, the whole topic comes up because we have all these new technologies. And um, one part of new technologies is how we balance that against our freedoms. And just to start off, um, it's very important to me. I was that kid that was taking apart his computer himself, that, you know, programmed his own web pages and so on. And most of the privacy people are like that. They see the freedom in a lot of the tech. Um, if you look at, for example, minorities that can suddenly connect online that weren't able to do that before, freedom of speech possibilities and so on. So there's a lot of freedom in uh, technology. At the same time, this freedom can also be under pressure from a lot of that technology. And I think that's interesting to talk about, especially if you go into that area of privacy, which is only one small part of this freedom debate. Um, so I just wanted to frame that, that there's actually a much bigger picture. I'm basically just going to talk about that privacy part of it. Um, to probably introduce you to the privacy debate a bit is, I think always important. it's always important to think about two different levels of privacy that we usually have. There is this idea of being surveilled or the feeling that someone may look at you. Um, a perfect example are these panopticum um, situations where these are prison cells. That's an old prison in Cuba that doesn't exist anymore. But basically, there's only one guard in the middle and probably hundreds of people that are in, in these prison cells. And that guard could not possibly surveil everybody. It's impossible. But the people in the cells have the feeling that they may be looked at in this moment. And that changes their behavior. And I think that's the first level of privacy that's always important to think about. It's oftentimes not actual misuse of data, 
but the change of our behavior once we feel we're not necessarily private. And that's the first level of privacy. The second level that we usually talk about much more is if there is actually a consequence, if there is a data breach, if your credit was denied, if there's something in the database that is wrong where you have a consequence from. And that's not the most of the cases we deal with. We actually oftentimes deal with the first layer more than the second layer. However, this layer is easy to understand, a credit was denied, while the first layer of just this feeling of surveillance is a very abstract kind of phenomenon that's usually hard to explain. To get, kind of boil it down, I made, for example, an access request for a CCTV camera in Vienna that's an um, electronic store. And a lot of the CCTV at the time, you will probably hardly recognize me on that picture, is not working because you can actually find that guy that stole something for 20 euros because it's not even worth the effort to even um, dig up that picture. But the feeling of surveillance changes people and probably makes sure that they steal less. So you have these two things even with something simple like CCTV. What a lot of people then say is, you know, actually I have nothing to hide. Um, it, this kind of argument gets less and less, but it's still around and the feeling is, you know, what is really the problem? And I think something that is um, important to uh, note is that a lot of the privacy rights are kind of meta rights. They are important so that we can exercise other rights that we feel about probably a bit stronger. Typical example is the freedom of speech. If I'm in a confined space, if I talk to my friends, if to my peers, then I'm usually much more open in what I say than if I'm probably out here on the stage. And that privacy is necessary for us to probably strive, explain, and, and say all these things. Actually, my favorite example for privacy is usually anything that's sexual or uh, relationship-wise. Um, because here there's no logic behind it. There's not really any logic why you cannot have sex on the street. So far, no one could ever explain the logic behind it to me. It's totally cultural. It's something that we as humans feel is private, that is, you know, cozy at home. Um, but there's not really any logic behind that part of privacy. And that is something that I think is oftentimes important to accept, that not everything that we feel we want to keep to ourselves is necessarily logical. It may just be our culture that feels this is now my own space and not yours. Um, something that's very logical and very traditional is the privacy in the voting booth, for example, because we only vote really freely if we know that no one is looking. Um, so in Austria, we had a lot of fun when Trump was elected because in the US they were like, oh my God, people polled differently than they voted, so they didn't tell pollsters that they actually vote for Trump. Now in Austria, we have that phenomenon since the 90s, um, right-wing parties, and the polling, we actually have a factor we put in for the right-wing party because we know people do not self-declare they vote for the right-wing party. They only do that in the privacy of the voting booth. And <laughs> that changes that behavior. Um, also related to Trump and the privacy in the voting system is probably the reason why this picture got very uh, much excitement around the world. Because you see how privacy is more limited here. It's just half a meter high compared to European voting booths. Um, and I'm still wondering what she actually voted for, but let that, <laughs> let that be another story. Um, another element of privacy is that a lot of this information is power today. So as we're moving into an information age, it kind of becomes obvious that information becomes more and more and more powerful. And that's mainly because we can process the information that we weren't able to process before. So the information was oftentimes there before, but it was too hard to actually use it and um, be kind of um, be p more powerful through that information. And if you think about your life a bit like a poker game, it's probably a bit of an extreme view, but a lot of our interactions are a bit of like a poker game. For example, if you hire for a new job and you don't know, do they have another candidate that you know, fulfills the criteria as well? How far can I go up with the money I'm asking for? That's a lot of like, if I know they only have one person, then I'm probably going in a totally different way into negotiation about my salary than if I know they have actually five people and I'm just the third candidate on the list. Um, and that's a pure um, difference in what your views are or what your um, power is only by that little information. To make that a bit more concrete, um, the airline industry had the idea, they dropped it later, that you may only get airline tickets anymore if you first register with your name. So instead of searching online and get different prices, you would get a price dependent on your name, your frequent flyer number, all of that. And the idea behind that was rather simple. To give you a simple example, I was in Washington on Friday and I had to be here and there and I had to be here today. That's only two calendar entries. It's not a lot of information, not very personal. I think that's even online. But if SAS would have known that that's the reality, 
and would have tacked it to my price, then suddenly my flight would have probably been 200% more expensive. <laughs> because they would have known it's two conferences, so probably someone else pays for this flight, not that guy himself. He will probably just take the most convenient flight between these two points. There are not a lot of flights between Washington and here that you could possibly take. And I would have probably ended up paying much more. And that is not the reality yet, but it's, simply, it's very simple and very possible and very close to that system. We already have price discrimination. And the interesting thing is, the other way around, I don't know if their plane may to be totally empty. Like, I have no clue what their information is or what, what their booking situation is. And I may have just waited for another month to book it if I would have known that plane is totally empty, but I don't. So it depends on who has what information, how this transaction changes. Another element of privacy, which I think is very important, especially in the European um, context, is that all of this is highly cultural. We have different subject matters that we feel are private or not. Um, to give you an example, there is a wonderful part of a Supreme Court ruling from the United States when they had to decide the first time about privacy in uh, telephone communications. And there's this sentence where they talk about if, so, so far the US felt that basically your home is part of your private sphere. And the debate was, is a telephone line part of that private sphere? And the judge said, wires are not part of the house or office any more than the highways along which they are stretched. So they basically said your phone conversation is as private as a highway. That was in 1928, that was changed in the 60s later. But at the time, something that we feel is totally obvious, that a phone conversation is somewhat private, was not private at all, um, at least under the Fourth Amendment at the time. There were laws later introduced in the US to cover up for the problem. At the same time, already in the 80s, the Germans were, for example, very progressive in their rulings on a right to informational self-determination that they got out of the right to dignity. So um, there is a lot of uh, progressive stuff here. Also, culturally, what was interesting, we had these debates around GDPR, and I was uh, rather involved in that. And one example that I had to put into the presentation was usually the Swedish tax records. That always came up in Brussels, because there was this, like, even the tax records are public there, and that's crazy. And how is that ever going to comply with GDPR and transparency? And there's, like, this cultural fight there. At the same time, for example, we got it as Austrians or Germans oftentimes because we have this um, registry system, I don't know if that exists in Sweden as well, where you have to register your home address with the government as soon as you move. And that is something that in the UK or Ireland they felt is a total privacy violation. Why we felt that's totally normal because we do that for, our, I think, 50 or 60 years now and no big problem. So even within Europe, we had very different views on each one of these um, issues and, and these privacy issues. Usually you had like a feeling that in Austria, usually more this Catholic confessional thing where everything is like just hidden in a box and otherwise you're private, um, while other people were more progressive on that. Um, but I usually joke that that may come out of the whole Catholic, everybody's a sinner kind of idea, but who knows. Um, the interesting part about that cultural thing is we're now getting interconnected. So this clashes. Usually these cultures stayed within one country, but now you're Google or Facebook and the one country streams at you and says transparency is important and freedom of speech. The other country streams at you as privacy is important and we all have to come to some kind of consensus. And that was already hard enough if you see the debate around GDPR in Europe, but on a global stage, that's even gonna be much harder. So all of this is very, pri uh, very cultural. Typical example is, and what's important to think about as well is it's not just more or less privacy. So there are also different dimensions. Usually we're much more open about sexuality in Austria than in the US. That's more private there. Usually at the same time when it comes to financial stuff, I don't even know how much my friends are making because in Austria you just don't talk about financial stuff whatsoever. While in the US they're like, so much, how much are you worth? Where you like, don't ever talk about that in Austria. So there's even, there's not always more or less privacy. It depends on the, on, on the subject matter. And that's rather interesting too. Then there's usually the debate about government or industry. Um, I think after Snowden, we kind of have an idea how much surveillance goes on online. We know that most of these cables are tapped. That is what the safe harbor case was about as well. Um, but we also have a lot of these surveillance going through the big internet companies, for example, basically every phone in this room is probably somehow going to be controlled either by Google or by Apple because there's a duopoly on smartphones and basically you have to use one of the two. And um, you even have oftentimes national monopolies. So in most European countries, there's one dominant credit record company that basically says you're worth of a credit and you're not. It depends on the country how important they are. In Austria, they're not. But in Germany, for example, they are super important. 
and you end up with these monopolies basically having a say of who gets a phone contract or not. Um, you know the little Britain thing probably about um, computer says no. And um, we do have these situations, that's a lot of the complaints that we get up. And it takes a couple of months oftentimes until you actually get your, um, get your phone contract and so on. All of this is now kind of connecting, so I usually call it a public-private partnership on surveillance because a lot of what the government figured out is if I'm the NSA, I don't need to be in every phone. It's good enough if I can tug into the big internet providers and the big internet backbone companies and basically suck out the data from there. So this idea of we have government surveillance here and private stuff there kind of blends into each other more and more. Um, so we don't really think about that difference that much ourselves anymore. Um, for example, in the Snowden files, you see each one of these companies when they were actually connected up to the NSA system. We even have kind of outsourcing situations as where it's the other way around, where um, the governments outsource surveillance to private actors. At one example, I borrowed money to a friend in the US because he didn't have money and his credit card was gone and I was like, you know, I'm just going to take $200, put it underneath your um, door in the, in the hotel, and just gonna put that in an envelope. And we were joking about it because like $200 in cash in the US is like almost drug money or really suspicious. And a week or two later, I got a phone call from my bank and it was like, Mr. Schrems, you have a very weird transaction here. And I was like, I don't know. And it went a big back and forth and ended up that that guy actually put drug money as the purpose for the transaction into the transaction. And it took me about a month to get my money <laughs> because all of that was frozen. I was like joking, I was like, who in the world who is actually transferring drug money is going to put drug money in it? <laughs> but turns out governments basically require banks to scan all these, um, these elements and figure out if there is anything like that, which is also kind of a type of surveillance. I mean, in this case, it was funny and wasn't a big issue. But still, every transaction is scanned by your bank on behalf of a government. Um, I think all of this, what we try to kind of accomplish or look into is um, what I kind of call informational redistribution. That may sound, like, may sound like a big word or so, but basically the question is, if we're in an information society, who has the power over what information? And how much are we going to distribute information between different parts of our society? And that's very similar, like in a capitalistic society, how do we distribute wealth? We usually we do that with taxes and you know social benefits for someone else, because that's so far the most powerful thing we usually have is money. If we now move into an information age, how much have, do we have to redistribute distribute information to actually get this balance right? And I think we're at the very beginning of all of this. Um, but on the one hand, we usually have stuff like these privacy laws that make sure that not too much information is going fr from the bottom up in simple terms. Or we have rights like a Freedom of Information Act or a right to access where I can get information back down. That's a very kind of a starter for this whole debate. But I think that's where we see a lot of these laws, how they regulate. And if you want to put it in a bigger picture, I think that's roughly what um, could balance these information imbalances a bit. Um, so. I was asked to also talk about a bit how we actually implement these things and how these solutions can work. And um, I just wanted to kind of start with the solutions that I don't think work at all. First of all is usually the idea of education. So we have a lot of people should just be more knowledgeable, understand that, read all the privacy policies and so on. And the reality is this is all way too complicated that every person is going to understand it. I work on Facebook for I think eight years now and I can still not tell you how Facebook really works. We actually had two weeks ago a witness from Facebook in the courtroom in Vienna, and she said she couldn't explain how their facial recognition works. And if their chief privacy officer cannot explain how their facial recognition works, there's no way that an average person will understand it. Um, so it's important to have education and to kind of make people aware of, of these problems, but I don't think that that's going to solve the issue much. This is usually highly connected to kind of a um, responsibility shifting towards the user. So the idea is instead of the companies being compliant and thinking about privacy, it's you as a user that has to be informed, responsible, not user service. So I'm not sure if this is really going to change anything. Closely connected to that idea is the idea of notice and choice that comes a lot out of the US law. And the idea of that is you put a huge sticker on it, and then people basically make an informed choice to take it or leave it. That's notice and choice. We have that in a lot of areas. And to give you a good example for that, I actually rented a car in um, LA and it had that sticker on it. And if you zoom into the sticker, it's a warning about cancerous material. 
And it basically says this car has um, chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm. And then your choice is to either drive that car or leave it, or walk. That's notice and choice. And that's how we try to do privacy online for the last 10, 15 years. There's a big notice saying, we're going to fuck you with all your data. Now, either be on that page or leave it. And that's basically the solution that we had. To give you like a joke on that is like this cancer warning is even on Disneyland in California. So you basically have the choice to go through the cancerous Disneyland with your kids or um, go home and not have Mickey. Um, I don't think that's a solution at all for these obvious reasons. There's a lot of technical solutions, there's a lot of possibilities with encryption and so on, where I'm not the expert to talk about, where we actually can, um, just by factually limiting access to data or being smart about who has what, um, actually get around a lot of these privacy problems. And I think um, that's one of the sites where other people are much more um, informed to talk about. We usually talk about the legal solutions right now. So especially in Europe, we are in the special situation that we do have a fundamental right to privacy and data protection. That's in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So it's basically an EU fundamental right that is here and will stay for a long while. And there are different ways to enforce these things. First of all, we usually have the data protection authorities, DPAs. The problem with them is they oftentimes look, oftentimes look like this. This is the Irish data protection regulator until beginning of this year. They now got a new office. But this down here is a supermarket. And that blue door back there is the place that regulates Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, you name it. Um, at the time when we started, they had 20 people of which there was not a single lawyer, not a single technician. The head of that organization was a diplomat before. And they apparently regulated European privacy because in Europe it depends where the headquarter of a company is, not where the users are. And that basically meant they could basically do whatever they wanted to do. It got much better now. They got a new office, 100 people there. But still, if you look at the annual report, 89% of the complaints are not dealt with. So you do have a fundamental right to privacy, and you can complain to that office, but only 2% of the complaints are actually taken in. And that means it's a bit like a, a fundamental right to vote, but just in 98% of the times, there's just no voting booth. That's a bit how we do privacy right now in Europe. Um, so what we try to do is to be a bit smarter. There are certain doors and ways you can get through. The whole European system is a bit like a maze. But there are ways to go through authorities that are more likely to actually get something done. There is also now on the European level a board that regulates these different countries if they don't really do their stuff. We had actually the first complaint that we filed already led to 50 million as a fine against Google, which at the time was great and huge. I was joking, it's like that's probably their revenue of like 10, 10 minutes or whatever, <laughs> but it's at least a start. Um, the other option we have right now is to go through courts. Um, there is a lot of appetite for that. The problem with going to court over your privacy is um, we have one case pending in, in Vienna, and that's five years now. So that's from the first hearing. And you see the difference in my age. <laughs> um, that's five years ago, and it costs a shitload of money. Like, you usually invest really hundreds of thousands of euros in a case like that. And that's just to clarify that you get access to your data or something like that. So what we're looking into a lot now is different types of collective redress. So the idea that if 100 people get together or 1,000 people get together, and claim their rights, then it's much more likely to get anything done. There are different ways to do that in Europe. There's different types of collective redress. But what they all boil down to is the costs go down per person and the claims go up. And that's tr dramatic for the companies because 50 million as a penalty is nice. But if you have, let's say, 20 million people that get together and say, we want to have damages, and each one of, one of us wants 1,000, then you talk about totally different numbers even for Google. So we already started doing stuff like that where we, for example, had an app for a Facebook class action. And that's, in my view, great use of technology. We even used the Facebook API, so you had to log in with your Facebook credentials, and we pulled the data from Facebook to verify you actually had an account. Um, so we, we use technology in, in wonderful ways um, just for different, um, different aims after all. Um, finally, um, we basically have an option in the EU to also have NGOs, so nonprofit organizations, to enforce these rights. Um, that's a bit on what I'm working on right now. We have this organization, as mentioned, called NOIB, and the idea is that these organizations can represent individuals, because the average guy is not going to be able to do all of this, but an NGO can do that. So we started the first one on a European level, um, based in Vienna, but basically we have a team that comes out of the whole EU. Um, right now we even have one guy from Norway, so at least they 
may be able to understand everything here. Um, and we tried to build that further and further to cover most of the European Union. Last point that I wanted to make is I think almost all of these issues are going to go back to the Court of Justice of the European Union. So we're actually waiting right now for the next couple of years because as GDPR, this new privacy law was introduced, tons of cases will get, go back to the Court of Justice and will probably clarify how far these rights go and how they are to be enforced. And um, we're actually very much thinking that there may be tons of good cases coming out of it. Right now, the judges are actually very proactive on all of this. And I hope that I'm going to get a picture like that that is actually a full victory thing um, and not just a made up one. And that's what we're basically working on. And we hope we're going to get done. We had the slogan back then, make privacy real, because I think what we have on paper, if we get that somehow in reality, would actually be a cool thing. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Please yep. uh, have a seat. Thank you for this excellent and very interesting uh, presentation. Um, yeah, we, we have a bunch of questions for you, of course, because this is going to be really interesting to, good. to talk about, <laughs> to discuss further. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, first of all, I mean, you're working to increase or protect individuals' online privacy, right? Um, and some would argue that the best approach is the technical solution or, or otherwise. Why is it that you believe in the legal approach, per se? I think to a large extent it's because you're a lawyer and you try to work in your area that you know of. Um, but there are certain situations where um, other people simply need your information. It's not like they shouldn't have it. The big issue in GDPR is what they use it for. That's what we call purpose limitation, probably a very legalistic term. But the idea is, for example, if I share very personal stuff with my doctor, I like that doctor to have even more of that personal stuff to help me. But I probably don't want that doctor to share it in the next restaurant and tell everybody else about Max's proms over there. Um, so that's what we call purpose limitation. You give information for a certain reason, and you're totally happy with the other person having that information, but you don't want it to be misused for something else. Um, and that is something that the law can, for example, do quite well, where we can say you get that information, it's, it's OK that you have it, but you're then not allowed to do evil things with it. And there is oftentimes not a lot of technical ways to do that, really. There are other situations when it's about, I don't know, foreign surveillance and so on, where encryption can totally solve that problem. So I usually say it's a bit like if you think about the burglars. Obviously, it's good that there is a police force, and if someone breaks into your house, that they do something about it. At the same time, police also have a lock. And if we have that combination, I think we can get a lot of these things done. Right, so we can work on all frontiers, so to speak. I'm just not the tech person. So. Right. <laughs> um, but I mean, you've mentioned that we have pretty good data protections in place, but we're just notoriously bad at enforcing them. I mean, and the 98% versus the 2%. Um, why is that? And, and, and what are the barriers in place for, for us? And, and how could Europe get better at this? Yeah, so we have a fundamental problem in Europe that we're great at, at complaining, especially versus the US, and say it's like evil, terrible companies over there. Um, but we don't really enforce our laws. And um, one part of it is a problem that is structural for the whole EU and not specific to privacy at all. It's the EU doesn't have executive powers. They only pass laws. And then each member state has to, pro member state has to properly enforce them. And the reality is that countries like Ireland or Luxembourg are usually there to not enforce law. The whole idea is you have a headquarter in the middle of, e of the EU where you don't pay taxes, where a lot of the, I don't know, copyright laws are not properly enforced, hosting laws are not properly enforced. Um, we even had issues that Facebook didn't have an email address on their web page. Now, it's an EU law that every company has to have a way to communicate with them, just not Facebook. So. Um, we complained about that, too, because I got all the emails after all. And um, it took about two years that they even get a stupid email address on their web page. And it's amazing because if you have to compete with a company like that, you don't have to answer any emails. You basically get rid of 20 jobs that you know, have to answer these emails, or probably in Facebook's case, 100 jobs. Um, and that is a bit of an, a bubble that is created within the EU where our rules do not apply. And factually, there's apply on paper but they are not factually enforced. And um, that is a, a, a huge structural problem. On top of that, you have legal systems that are very complicated. So 
the case we have right now pending at the Court of Justice costs about 10 million euros in, in, to enforce in Ireland. So whoever loses that case over NSA surveillance has to pay 10 million euros. Wow. And that factually means no one in the world is ever going to file that case. Um, I mean, I filed it because I figured out after a while that there is no enforcement for this type of cost in Austria. So I was like, I'm just not going to have a summer house in Ireland, and I'm fine. <laughs> um, but that's not how we should actually operate in Europe. And I think that is, um, on top of the consumer rights issues, also a fair competition issue. Because mm -hmm. we do have one common market, and if some companies in the EU are held to a proper standard, and others are not, then we have a serious competition issue. So we actually have um, a lot of companies that support us as well. Not that much, we're still mainly a consumer rights organization. We're mainly supported by individual donations. But you see that the companies that are trying to kind of comply with these things realize that they need others, or they need someone to also push for these things because it's a, a fairness issue after all. So an argument that I hear a lot from uh, people who like Facebook uh, and from a lot of entrepreneurs is like, this is a victimless crime. There's no bodily, bodily harm done to anybody. Mm. What's the worst that could happen? Uh, so if a lot of data ch changes hands and data ends up in the wrong hands, what really happens? What, what would your response be to that? Like, um, what's, the, what's the worst thing that has happened and what is the worst thing that could uh, happen? I think there, hasn't, there was not too much that happened factually so far. That's what I tried to put in as well. Um, and that's a bit of partly the reason because you're not allowed to use a lot of that data in Europe. Um, on the other hand, we still are just on the edge of all of this. So I think there is, like if there wouldn't be any rules and there would be a data breach and you could just suck up that data and then do whatever you want to do with it, then we would have much more consequences, obviously. Um, at the same time, what's important in is, is these two levels of privacy. The harm is something that we oftentimes don't factually have. It's more the feeling of surveillance that changes our behavior. And um, there are a lot of, um, especially if you think about minorities and so on, there are a lot of people that can only strive if there is somewhat of a privacy. That may go both ways. Like for us, as I explained with the polling situation, the right-wing parties now strive a lot in their little privacy in, in Austria. That's something that um, technology has allowed. On the other hand, for example, um, so I, I'm gay. I had my coming out when I was 14. And one way to find other people, and a whole reason, I think, why the whole uh, gay community strived that much the last couple of years is technology, because you have a safe space where you can communicate with other people, um, and that's offline, that's, or like, that's online, but in, in their own spaces and um, allows you to kind of uh, you know, put your political beliefs there, push for, I don't know, gay marriage or whatever, what, what people are into. Um, and that is stuff that is, to a certain extent, only possible if there is a certain grade of privacy at the same time. Um, and probably in our cultures less, but in other cultures, it's much more of a topic that that has to be 100% private because you lose your job and all of that kind of stuff. So a lot of the um, empowering is only possible if you have somewhat of that privacy. And that's not necessarily that there is only consequence, but people may not even go online and connect with someone else if they wouldn't know it's private. And I think that is something that we oftentimes have to think about when we talk about privacy is these um, as I called it, like a bit of a meta right. Like you only are able to exercise other rights if they're somewhat private. A uh, typical example for that is in, in Austria, for example, or in other uh, countries as well. It's now prohibited to have any kind of face cover when you're at a, pro a protest. Um, at the same time, the police runs around with cameras. And I do have friends that said, I'm not going to go to a demonstration if I know I'm going to be videotaped. And that probably goes into some crazy face recognition in 10 years. And that means that our democracy or our freedoms in that area are diminished to a certain extent. I'm, you know, probably that is not going to kill it all, but there are oftentimes a hundred of these little elements that overall change your society. And I think that's oftentimes something that's overlooked when we just kind of ask for the dead body in, <laughs> in privacy, because that oftentimes doesn't exist that directly. Yeah. But you're talking also about these cultural differences in privacy, right? And, and, and that makes it a bit complicated when it comes to regulations. And, uh, I mean, you mentioned that during your presentation. Do you believe that there is a one-size-fits-all? No. Um, or, and how, how, <laughs> how should we deal with that then? Um, I mean, I how think, are you dealing with this? Uh, I think to a certain extent we have to recognize that we'll have to have different sizes globally and that we have to just recognize that there's different feelings around that. 
Um, I think certain things are shifting. Just the fact that there is social media and Twitter and people put stuff out changes our societies as well. And that our privacy perceptions may change over that. And that's fine too. Like if the majority view is if I'm naked online, that's fine because I post my dick pics myself. <laughs> then that's probably the new social norm. I wouldn't. I don't know if that's what I would go for. But um, we're not there yet, definitely. And as far as we still have, and if you look at, at polling and research, we have a huge majority that says I want to be protected better online, not less. Um, I think as long as that's true, we basically owe it to democracy and a, a um, rule of law situation that this is then properly enforced. Um, and I think that's that's part of, uh, of of what we're trying to do there. The whole idea that people care about privacy, and you were saying now that there is a movement towards wanting more privacy, not less. Do you feel that people understand what it means? Like, what, what, what is it that they're actually sharing yeah. online? Because that's something that we at the Internet Foundation in Sweden is trying to work with, is raising people's awareness of yeah. what is the data that you're sharing and what could it possibly mean? Because the way we see it is that most people actually don't care. Yeah. They're using the I don't have anything to hide argument, as you were saying. But how do we raise just the awareness? You're saying that you don't believe in education. Well, <laughs> what then? What, you know, I, I, what should I, we do? Don't get me wrong. I don't believe in no education. I think it's not the it's not going to win the battle. Right. Um, and I think that's that's important to differentiate. I think education is a big part. It's interesting, however, that, for example, if you go to schools, usually the kids are like, oh my god, my grandma puts crazy stuff online, mm -hmm. and she doesn't even know how to do the privacy settings. Well, if you talk to older people, like, oh, my kids do crazy stuff. So it's kind of interesting that everybody accuses each other of not getting it right. <laughs> um, but I think awareness is a big part in just in that area where you're able yourself to control what you put online. So that's one part. And that is something where education is important and where you can control, you know, what do I share online, when do I want to delete it, stuff like that. However, a big part, if you really dive into that debate, is not what we see on the screen, but what happens in some server in the background. Um, so my credit ranking is usually not done on what I share, but on some weird analytics that goes on in the background that I oftentimes have never even remotely put data in or even agreed to. Um, and that is the part that I think is especially interesting and that's very hard to explain to people um, because it's super complex and I honestly don't have a full answer on how to cope with that. Other than that, we get people to have a certain stomach feeling around it, to have an abstract feeling of do I want that or not. That's, I think, what awareness can also do. Like, that's where education is helpful. Um, but I'm usually comparing it to, I don't know, climate change or whatever. I have the feeling that we should do something about it, yes. But do I really know how all of these mo models work and what, you know, how many, you know, cubic meters of ice are going to melt if I, I don't know, take this flight back to Vienna or whatever? No, I don't. So I think we have to be realistic about what people can understand and can process, get it that far but then have experts to actually work on the details of it. And that's how we approach almost any problem in life, because all of these problems are way too big for anybody specifically to answer. Um, and it's similar, like I usually compare it to building codes. Like we all sit in this great hall, but no one of us has checked the foundations here, and no one would ever say if this collapses now that it's your fault you haven't checked that. But that's interestingly what the industry managed in the privacy world. Like I get that even from journalists, the first question is, shouldn't the users read it all and they have clicked yes, mm. don't, didn't they? And it's a bit like, you know, shouldn't the the people here in the audience have checked the food before they ate it and kind of really didn't they agree by eating it that they may get a stomach ache tomorrow. It's not how we, how we regulate anything else from food safety to, I don't know, building safety or so on. Just interestingly, when it comes to privacy, this argument kind of prevails um, because I think it came strongly out of the Actually, the background is the, US, uh, the California Business Code because mm. it requires these notices. And that manages this responsibility shifting where suddenly a 70-year-old seven year lady that wants to see the kids' pictures and therefore logs onto Facebook suddenly should actually take the responsibility for everything Facebook does. And it's weird. We don't do that anywhere else but in privacy. And that's one of the things we try to, to fight the most, um, that this feeling of it's your fault, you did it wrong. Um, when actually it's companies probably fucking you quite well on that data and, and not really um, giving you any even option to protect. That's another thing is like if, if consent is really done in a proper way, which you can do, if you have inline consent, there are a lot of ways to really do that in a proper way where if you use a product the first time, there's a pop-up saying, you know, do you want A or B? And then you can say A or B, then it's actually really your responsibility. But usually it's a pop-up saying, 
20 pages, agree here, no other option, and yeah. that's not really anything that... Or no Mickey. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's not really what gets you anywhere. Interestingly, for example, Facebook has now argued in the latest case that there is no consent anymore. Since GDPR came in, they now argue that you haven't ever agreed to any of it. Mm. But they made a new contract where they say the personalized experience is part of the contract, and to provide you that personalized experience, they need all your data anyways, and the, one, and the data of all of your friends. And therefore, you don't even have an option to say no which was an interesting, like it's a bit of a legalistic thing, but they basically said we move consent into the contract and therefore you don't have any consent anymore. That's like what they then do in practice and still say it's your responsibility at the same time. So since you're talking about this, uh, this ongoing issue there, uh, would you be able to break down to us um, dummies a little bit uh, what the the new case, the Schrems 2.0, that you're okay. all over the media about. Would you be able to try yes, to break uh, it down? In, I in, understand it's complex. In very simple terms, this case went around 300 times. But uh, basically, we know since Snowden that Facebook has to forward your data to the NSA. And that means whatever you or your friends put online, a lot of people say, I don't have Facebook because they're now all on Instagram, which is also owned by Facebook. But we even have on Facebook kind of shadow profiles where people that don't have, that have never used Facebook still have a profile because they keep the data from everybody else and then know there's someone in the middle that's missing. Um, long story short, all of this data basically is under US law going to the NSA. And they can pull that data whenever they feel like it. That's a violation of EU fundamental rights. So, Technically, if you're in, in Sweden, you have a contract with Facebook Ireland. Facebook Ireland is an EU company and has to abide by all of these rules, but they're still sending all the data primarily to, to the US and to Luala, or however it's called, where the data center is here in Sweden. Mm -hmm. But that's only one part of it. Luleå. <laughs> What's that? Luleå. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> My Swedish. Good try, though. Good try. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the, the story is basically, in the EU, you're not allowed to send data abroad unless you can guarantee that your privacy is respected abroad. So there's basically an export control on data, if you want to call it that way. And the law says, unless you can actually guarantee your data is secure in the US, you cannot export it. Facebook still sent the data to the US, knowing that it goes to the NSA and said, no problem, there is no NSA. That's fundamentally what the case is about. Back then, they did it under one instrument, which is called Safe Harbor. Now there's a new instrument called Privacy Shield, and a third instrument called Standard Contractual Clauses. That's all legalese. But basically, these are the pieces of paper you have to sign to send the data over to the US. And our core argument in all of this is, the law says you're not allowed to send it over if you know it goes on, into mass surveillance. And you do exactly that, so whatever piece of paper you signed here is irrelevant. And that's kind of roughly what this boils down to. The problem that I have with the case is there is not really a solution. Like for all of these privacy issues, we can usually tell them, change this button, change that there, and you're all fine. A huge problem that we have is with online surveillance, and that's true for the EU as well. We have a lot of EU countries doing similar surveillance. Um, that this may balkanize the internet to a certain extent, mm -hmm. because if we say, we cannot send data to China anymore because they may surveil us. We cannot send data to Russia anymore because they may surveil us. We're not allowed to send data to the US anymore because they surveil us. Then we're basically splitting up the internet into different parts. And we have basically have data nationalization somehow. And that's not really what the internet is made for. So it's kind of a weird case because the ultimate solution of all of this is not what I really want. But I think the only solution for all of this is that among the Western countries, we get to a consensus of how much online surveillance is, is tolerable and OK. Probably not going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. Yeah. But at a certain point, we may get to a conclusion that we say, OK, Europeans respect Americans' right to privacy as well as the other way around. Even within the EU, like Ger Germany basically says you can surveil Austrians, but not Germans, which is kind of weird even within the EU. Um, and that's stuff that we'll have to look into in the long run, especially when data becomes a huge asset. What in this case is probably important to add is we're not only talking about privacy. We basically talk about espionage, about uh, sanctions that are enforced. So for example, Austria has a lot of trade with Russia, with um, Iran. And these things are oftentimes on the US sanctions list. So our companies may simply suffer when that data goes, goes abroad, because um, they will get sanctions from the US. And that's especially interesting in, 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 in these cases. It's not just about privacy. It's really about this power that you have through data. And if foreign governments get that data, then you may sometimes be in a weird situation as a European company.
you might not want to answer this question, or maybe you do, but <laughs> do you use social media yourself? I do. I, I, and, and what's important to me, I mean, in this presentation, it was not a lot, um, not a lot about like, the factual violations of Facebook that they have. There's, I could talk about that for, a t for an hour. But I think what's important is I still use uh, Facebook not that much because it's just the content got boring on there. It's mainly advertisement, but for example, Twitter. And I think it's important that we own these places still, like that we don't say, you know, there's privacy issues. Let's go back to our little dark cave and just have a landline telephone and not use it. All of this technology is really great. It's empowering. Um, but we have to make sure that it's also um, that the dark sides of it are probably pushed back a bit. And I think that's as with any transfer in technology, um, there are tons of good things. There are tons of, like, industrialization gave us the world as it is today. But still, workers' rights were a good addition to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a bit how I look at privacy, that the core idea of all of this is great, and we should totally use it. Um, but we also have to talk about some issues that come with it and how we can solve them. And I think they are totally solvable. Um, sometimes we may need to push a bit in a couple of courts to get it solved after all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Max. And please stay with us as we switch to Swedish sure. for the last <laughs> few sentences. Thank you. Thanks.